Good. Um, um, and yes, um, please interrupt um, with questions. Um, um, I, I, I had the feeling a little bit yesterday that Tim's um, talk at, at the beginning of the day to the effect that maybe he had opened up, you know, in, invited too many questions had more of an effect that he intended it to. And yesterday there seemed to be many fewer questions. So do ask questions. Um, if I feel they're leading us in a non-productive direction, um, I'll, I'll say so. Um, um, so I, the, the official title of this was the reduction of thermodynamics to statistical mechanics. Um, what I'm going to be talking about is actually a bit more panoramic uh, than that. Um, um, Wayne, I think, is going to be on Friday um, giving some rather detailed accounts of, uh, uh, of deductions of um, thermodynamics from statistical mechanics. This is going to be more about sketching out um, the relationship of statistical mechanics to the, to the broader architecture of the general scientific picture of the world. Um, indeed, it's going to be um, um, laying out a way of reading statistical mechanics as providing the broad architecture uh, of the scientific picture of the world. This is a reading of statistical mechanics, which is sometimes referred to as the imperialist uh, reading of statistical mechanics for obvious reasons, uh, an unfortunate name, but not an inappropriate one. Um, um, so that's the, that's the sort of thing I'm going to talk about today. As Tim already suggested, um, some of this may uh, bring out controversies um, between various different people in the room. I take it that's a good thing. Um, um, uh, it'll, it'll be good to be exposed to some uh, debate. Um, the one other thing to say in a sort of introductory way is that um, uh, the way, you know, it, it's definitely the case for me that the approach to statistical mechanics that I understand clearly is the individualist Boltzmannian uh, approach. And this talk will be very much um, in that spirit. Um, OK. So here's the first thing to say by way of getting a, a wider foothold for something like statistical mechanics. Here's a really prosaic observation, which nevertheless I don't think is made often enough um, in discussions of the sort of fundamental principles of physics. It's this. Take a theory like Newtonian mechanics. Um, um, Newtonian mechanics in and of itself, that is the dynamical equations of motion of Newtonian mechanics, as a matter of fact, that is even if the world were, if we're assuming the world were Newtonian, would tell us almost nothing by themselves of any interest about how the world actually behaves or what kinds of expectations we should have of the future given the present. Suppose we were to ask, for example, whether um, we should be worried that five minutes from now um, the Earth is suddenly going to take a right turn out of its orbit and go careening towards the sun. Well, um, it's easy to show um, by just, the, it, it's easy to prove um, by the time reversibility of Newtonian mechanics, that, uh, that such a trajectory would be perfectly in accord with the Newtonian equations of motion. That is, um, 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 the following is possible. The Earth is coming radiantly, radially outward from the sun with a certain forward velocity. Another, a, a subatomic particle, but moving extremely fast with extremely high momentum, collides with it, um, um, they stop each other's motion there, and the Earth then 
enters its standard orbit around the sun. Um, um, this is clearly a solution to the Newtonian mechanical equations of motion. It follows that the time reverse, um, where the Earth, as it were, at least for all macroscopic intents and purposes, spontaneously ejects such a particle, takes a right turn, and heads into the sun, killing us all, um, is necessarily also uh, a solution to the Newtonian mechanical equations of motion. And um, more generally, Because then there might have been questions about how the particle gets ejected, I suppose. Um, say it again. I, I, I take it. Good. I, if I didn't need it so much, the better. Um, um, I guess the intuition was that everybody can imagine um, a particle coming in and getting lodged in the Earth, as it were, in that way. Maybe they have more difficulty imagining the Earth conspiring to eject it, but it follows from the possibility of this uh, and from the time reversibility of the Newtonian equations of motion that if this is possible, the other is possible. I thought the first one was more intuitively, obviously possible than the second. If not, so much the better. Um, um, good. And more generally, it's hard to imagine um, obvious reasons why a whole host of sort of obviously preposterous things, like the Earth suddenly, um, um, you know, decomposing itself into uh, statuettes of the British royal family, or, or the Earth beginning to utter the Declaration of Independence, um, or something like that. Um, it, it, it's, it's, hard to, uh, it's hard to come up with clear arguments as long as we're not violating conservation of energy, conservation of momentum, so on and so forth. It's hard to give an argument that these things wouldn't be among the solutions to the equations of motion either. Um, so what these kinds of examples are supposed to make clear is that the vast majority, you know, is that the equations of motion by themselves, that is the stipulation that the distinction between what's physically possible and what's physically not possible is just what's given by the equations of motion, is going to tell you almost nothing about how the world actually looks and about the kinds of things that actually happen. If you want to get these equations to tell you something interesting about how the world actually is, there's going to have to be, in addition to just the equations of motion, some reason why certain solutions don't need to be worried about. Okay? Um, there's going to have to be some reason why the possibility that, that, um, that the world is on certain of the trajectories which Newtonian mechanics allows can somehow be discounted. Okay, or disregarded, or not seriously worried about, or however one wants to put it. Um, good. Um, the way we generally talk about these things um, although this will already be controversial, but maybe it'll be good to postpone the controversy until it becomes more explicit a little later in the talk. But the way we generally talk about these things is that those solutions, although possible according to the dynamical equations of motion, are fantastically unlikely. Okay? Um, there has to be some... Let me go back a step. There has to be some objective sense in which these things can be disregarded. Okay? Um, um, and the language we usually use to say why we disregard them is to talk about them as fantastically unlikely. And this suggests um, some notion of probability entering in here, some notion of chance entering in here. 
um, um, and the general, and, and it ought to be clear that this is a much more general phenomenon than just applies to, say, Newtonian mechanics. The general idea seems to be this. In any fundamental physical theory, and this is a characteristic of every fundamental physical theory that anybody has seriously entertained you know, in the past 300 years, um, if, the, if the picture we get from our fundamental physical theory is that, the, is that the macroscopic phenomena with which we're usually interested in the world are some kind of collective upshot of the behaviors of some enormous number of fundamental degrees of freedom, okay? Then intuitively, there are always going to be goofy ways in which those fundamental degrees of freedom could in principle be aligned, okay? That would make stuff happen that's crazy. Okay? And that doesn't happen and that we know isn't going to happen. Okay? Um, and as long as our picture of the physical world is anything like that, and it goes without saying that this is a feature that's shared by Newtonian mechanics and Maxwellian electromagnetism and um, quantum mechanics uh, and string theory and whatever you'd like, um, this is a very basic feature of the whole physical project so far. Um, something like probabilities or something like chances are going to have to appear somewhere, okay? Chances aren't something, at least as a logical matter, as a historical matter, chances in the foundations of physics are maybe something that we first stumbled onto in thinking about the reduction of thermodynamics to statistical mechanics. But it could have occurred to people long before that. It could have occurred to Newton, I don't know whether it did or not as a historical matter, that, that chances were going to have to be pervasive all over the place if we were going to get any kind of predictably useful and explanatorily useful account of what the world is actually like. Okay? If the structure of our physical theories is anything like we've always taken them to be, then chances are going to have to enter somewhere. And um, one of the profound jobs that statistical mechanics does has to do with making it clear how those chances enter, where those chances enter, and what kind of work they do. Okay? Um, and I, I, I shouldn't have used chances here. I want to be more neutral. Um, sometimes people like to talk about um, measures of typicality. Um, sometimes people like to talk even more vaguely about being surprised or not being surprised or, or, uh, uh, or uh, expecting a certain thing or not expecting a certain thing. The way I'm using the word chance here ought for the moment, although we're going to get into um, we're, we're going to get into more precise distinctions later on, ought to be a placeholder for all that kind of talk. That kind of talk is going to play some crucial role in getting anything at all out of the fundamental dynamical equations of motion, whatever they might happen to be. Okay. Um, good. One of the ways, I'll just put this on the, well, Maybe I'll put it on the table later. Um, okay. <clears throat> yes? I, 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 first of all, on, on a more pedestrian level, I mean, the answer is yes, explanation among other things, but just prediction, okay? I want the theory to tell me um, um, what I should expect to happen given what I know about how things are now, okay? Um, we're used to having our theories do that for us um, where, or, or we're, you know, th there wouldn't be a scientific enterprise if we couldn't get a hold of sufficient amounts of information to make um, interesting predictions about what's going to happen later. And the, the observation here is just um, 
the microscopic dynamical equations of motion by themselves are never going to do that for you. Yeah? So, people were making predictions of the clash of the Yeah. Yeah. So, they must have been implicitly... They must have. Yes. Yes. They must have. I mean, it's an interesting historical question to which I just don't know the answer at all, and maybe somebody in the room does, whether prior to the end of the 19th century, when probabilities were getting very explicitly involved in the foundations of physics, anybody commented on, you know, in this direction. I just don't know, I, I don't know the answer to that. They, you know, they, they, they certainly could have, okay? It, it, you know, it certainly must, you know, it could have been clear to Newton and to his contemporaries that everything I've just said here um, is true. Um, I don't know as a historical matter whether there was any commentary on this at all prior to the rise of statistical mechanics. Some of what he had in mind, you know, his famous line in the speech was what, atomic theory. Right. He said that nothing interesting would ever happen if there weren't words in the um, article. So he does he say that. Um, I mean, he also traces free will back to these swerves. Um, um, yeah, I mean, that's right. Even somebody like Lucretius should have been in a position to appreciate uh, an issue like this. Yeah, it goes back much farther than Newton. So the main insight is that big things are made out of lots of Big things are made out of lots of little, not, not even small things. If big things... If the situations of big things are dictated by enormous numbers of fundamental degrees of freedom, whether there's a physical composition there or not, you're going to be facing a, a problem a like this. I think he was talking about thermodynamics, actually. Oh, really? Yeah. Um, um, but, but it's similar there. I mean, Tim and I were discussing this um, just last night that. Uh, um, that, you know, the thermodynamic regularities are in some sense wildly multiply realizable, but, uh, but uh, any physical theory of the kind that's been envisioned for the past 300 years is going to face something like that. Yeah, Shelley. Something like what you're talking about in a highly sophisticated way is actually discussed by the probabilistic method of Newton, which is to say that the Kuronos principle. Right, right. Um, right, but it's not, it's not, it wasn't yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't about physics, it was about things that, right, right, but that was, but that was things that, that uh, and so far as I'm familiar with it, that was a discussion within probability theory, they thought they were talking about games of chance, they thought there was a particular range of phenomena that everybody agreed were chancy, whereas, Right. 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 Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, no. The, the, the question is, did they have any idea how widely invoked this was going to have to be? Right, right, right. That is, it's not just you need to invoke it when you're playing cards or you're playing, but that this is how physics works in a very fundamental way. Right. A much more important idealization problem probably was that assume only two bodies are Sure. No, no, no. But that's, but, but the, I don't know what you mean by the relative importance of these idealizations. They could have known that they were also discounting uh, a bunch of Just solutions. Right, 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 right. A bunch of solutions to the equations of motion. But anyway, I don't, I don't want to get too deep into the history here because it's not, it's not what I want to talk about. Huh, huh, huh. I'd love to, I'd love to know if anybody. Right. I mean, Barry is, Barry is sort of right. There's some sense in which Lucretius, you know, could have confronted a problem like this. Or, you know, maybe even if he was an ideal reasoner, ought to have confronted a problem like this. It wouldn't be surprising at all if the writing was gout somewhere. Uh huh. Somebody, <laughs> 
Yes. Conservation of what? Uh, we're le uh, we're and I, I'm speaking about the motion of the permanent motion of uh, planets, which was considered to be to be eternal. So oh, I see. So the stability. You, the you don't mean the, yes. You mean the stability of yes, the so planetary the motions? The yeah. Of yeah. 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 Equations. Yeah. Yeah. What is extremely strange is that, uh, and which goes in the R in the sense you are mentioning, that uh, Newton was conscious that there. Right. There is some uh, reason that God, and I don't know in which way right. he uh, considered it, but should intervene right. from time to time right. to, to bring things back right. and to um, make them eternal. Yes. And uh, um, Leibniz was making jokes of that, saying that it is like uh, the God is like a watchmaker right. who is not perfect. Right. He has to wind up. Right. right, 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 the, the right. Dog. Right, 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 right. This is, although this is the kind of problem that Shelley was referring to. It's a little different. That is, this is a problem that would arise even if we were dealing with point masses, um, um, the instabilities um, um, there. Um, this, the, you know, the, the worry there isn't about these, these chance issues. Yeah, Tim. But isn't there just an end body body problem worry about the stability? I don't, I, I, Even if there are I don't know. I, I think there's also an issue just about energy. Right. Just not conserved because it's the earth form. Which partly should be the two benches interact back and forth. Two bodies and other bodies, the energy could be transferred. Right. That's right. That's what I thought. Right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Anyway. Stop. <laughs> um um, okay. The point at which these concerns became a widespread and conscious preoccupation of theoretical physics was with the rise of statistical mechanics and with the attempt to reduce, in particular, thermodynamics um, to statistical mechanics. So, in order to get an idea of how these things work in general, um, this is a very useful paradigm case um, to talk about. And I just want to talk about it in a very sketchy way. If the traditional program of statistical mechanics, well, let me say something else before that. So, once again, at the moment, although I'm going to make more distinctions later on, I want to say this in a maximally neutral language. Um, statistical mechanics begins with a postulate to the effect that a certain natural looking, and I'll say more about what that means later, measure on the set of possible exact microconditions of any classical mechanical system is to be treated or regarded, and I'm bending over backwards here to be neutral, or understood or put to work um, as something like a probability distribution 
over those macro conditions, or is a typicality distribution over those macro conditions, a typicality measure over those macro conditions. We'll talk about those distinctions later. Um, um, it is a uh, notable fact that the measure in question here is the simplest imaginable measure um, on the set of possible exact micro conditions of whatever system it is we happen to be dealing with. That is, it's the standard Lebesgue measure on the phase space of the possible exact positions and momenta um, of the Newtonian particles that make the system we're dealing with up. And, yes? Say it again. Oh, no, they're the same. They're the same. It's, it's volume measure on phase space, yeah. Louisville measure um, 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 is called such because of its association with Louisville's theorem. But the, the measure that that theorem picks out is the Lebesgue measure. Yeah? That's true. Okay. Good, good. Good, absolutely it right. Doesn't matter which non -variable. Right, good, good, good. Tim? But I was, um, I just wanted to, because this is just one of my pet peeves. Lebesgue measure is a measure on the dual. Right, good. Fair enough. Good. good, 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 good. So it depends on the coordination. That's a better answer to your question. Good, yes? I'm sorry, talk a little less. That's true. Um, um, that's true. Of course, going to the limit is, is not the same thing as, as taking the number of particles to be literally infinite. Um, I don't know. Maybe somebody knows the answer to that. Is there something goofy that happens to the measure if the, if the dimensionality of the phase space is infinite? Yeah. You just get the things get funny. Right, right, you right. You define measures. Right. 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 That's right. Right. So, so, um, so the first answer vis-a-vis -vis this is, it doesn't matter um, because because we're interested in systems consisting of finite numbers of particles. But it's an interesting mathematical question, and I defer to Shelley. Um, um, here, yeah. So apparently, goofy things will happen um, if you go to if you if you imagine that the phase space is infinite dimensional. Um, good. Anyway, here's what um, here's what the project of statistical mechanics, insofar as it relates to thermodynamics, is then about. Okay. Um, consider a true thermodynamical law, any true ther thermodynamical law, to the effect that macro condition A evolves under such and such circumstances over such and such a temporal interval into macro condition B. Okay? Um, what all of the, of the work of statistical mechanics with regard to thermodynamics has been aimed at making plausible is a statement like this, okay? Um, once again, consider any, you know, any law to the effect that, the, any thermodynamic law to the effect that macro condition A evolves under such and such circumstances into macro condition B. Whenever such a law holds, the overwhelming majority of the volume of the, of, the, uh, 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 of the measure we've been talking, according to the measure we've been talking about, of the volume of phase space associated with macro condition A on this measure um, is taken up by micro conditions which are sitting on deterministic Newtonian trajectories which pass under the allotted circumstances at the end of the allotted interval um, through the region of the phase space associated with macro condition B. 
is this clear? This is, a, this is a long statement, but I think a conceptually simple one, and it'll be very important to everything that follows. Um, everybody clear on this? Yes? This is what the project of statistical mechanics, at least insofar as it's related to thermodynamics, is about. Okay? This is what it aspires to make plausible. The business of, of coming up with proofs of things like this, as has already been mentioned many times here, is an extraordinarily difficult mathematical task. Um, it's real trench warfare, you know, it's, it's, uh, um, it progresses by inches, it requires tremendous amounts of mathematical sophistication and computer time and, and God knows what else. Um, but um, I think it's also the case that as far as most physicists are concerned, um, the, the work of the project of statistical mechanics has succeeded in making claims like this very plausible, okay? That in the cases where we have been able to do the calculations, the results are good, okay? And there are all kinds of degrees to which, or simplifications through which, we can sort of do the calculations, and so on and so forth. The entire enterprise is aimed at making the statement I just read plausible, okay? That's what the project is about. Good. And if these arguments succeed um, in making this plausible, um, and if Newtonian mechanics or whatever other uh, micro theory we want to replace it with is true, um, then um, this probability distribution or this measure over microconditions together with those laws are going to underwrite enormous swaths um, of our empirical experience of the world. Um, um, it'll entail everything about ice melting um, and, uh, uh, and about smoke spreading and about things burning as opposed to unburning and, uh, and so on and so forth. Good. Yes, Barry. You said with the regularity for which when you ended up thinking this couldn't be done. Right. Do you think the response would be it's not a law? Or the response would be this project is clear? I, I think it depends on the kind of regularity it is, on how widespread it is, on how fundamental it looks. Um, I mean, yeah, we, you know, um, this is a very general sort of philosophy of science question. Um, um, and I think it's going to depend a lot on the details so of the actual the case. Exactly, right. So and, and, and in terms of its relation to more fundamental sciences. That's a nice way to put it. Yes, that's a nice way to put it. And you're, you're alluding to a case in which those pull in opposite directions. And, uh, uh, and in cases like that, everybody gets upset and there's lots of work to do and lots of interesting conversations to have. And who the hell knows what happened. Right, right. Good. Um, <clears throat> Let me say a little bit more at this point uh, uh, so, so let me, um, let me stop um, being so piously neutral about what this measure is doing um, um, and get into a little discussion about what people have thought about this measure, um, um, how we should understand it, um, what role it's playing um, in our cognitive life, uh, so on and so forth. So, I know of three attitudes. So somebody says, we have this very simple measure, a measure which in certain ways plays nicely with the dynamics, um, as was alluded to in the references to Louisville's theorem, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, um, this measure tells us um, um, if, the, uh, if, the thermodyna if the statistical mechanical project, as I just described it, works out right, 
that we can neglect the solutions um, where the Earth starts reciting the Gettysburg Address or, or decomposes itself into statuettes of the British royal family um, or anything like that. Um, those can be neglected. What's the source of the authority that this measure has to reassure us of these kinds of things? I know of three attitudes towards that in the literature, and let me just spell them out. The, the, now, once again here, I'm talking about history that I don't know, I don't really know in any detail. This is sort of surmising what must have happened or something like that, but people like Wayne um, may be able to, to correct me. Um, there's a very widespread, uh, in philo uh, widely discussed in the history of philosophy, principle of reasoning, which people refer to as principle of indifference, okay? which goes something like this. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> If, um, if I know that one of n possibilities is realized and I have no clue, and, and I have no further clue of any kind about which of them is realized, then um, um, the unique rational way for me to behave is to assign a probability of one over n to the proposition that any particular one of these possibilities obtains, okay? Um, um, this has a supremely innocent ring about it. Um, um, it sounds like, like, you know, the very model of being reasonable and sensible and non-dogmatic and, uh, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, and I believe, as a historical matter, that many of the founders of statistical mechanics um, had in mind some principle like this, that the measure that was chosen um, um, was one that assigned um, that, that was, was one that, given information about a macro state but no further information, was a way of assigning equal probability to all of the possible microscopic realizers of, uh, uh, of that macro state. Okay? Um, good. There's been a long discussion in the history of philosophy um, uh, about this principle. In terms of its application to statistical mechanics, there are at least two problems. A technical problem, which is very well known, a more conceptual problem, which I think is much more important, but is less widely discussed. Um, the technical problem is this. Look, um, um, the number of possible states we're dealing with here is not five or 10 or n or any finite number, but a continuous infinity. Um, of possible states. So what one wants here is some natural extension of counting, okay, from discrete finite cases to cases of, of continuously infinite sets of things. And the whole, sort, you know, the fundamental discovery of the mathematical theory of measure is precisely that there is no unique such extension, okay? That you make a list of properties that you want anything that deserves to be called a counting to satisfy, okay? And that is satisfied by all cases of counting in terms of finite numbers of things. And, uh, and try to see if you can come up with some extension of that uh, to, um, to continuously infinite cases. And there's a good news, bad news situation. The good news is you can come up with things that satisfy all those requirements. The bad news is you can come up with an infinite number of them, okay? 
and, uh, and there doesn't seem to be anything implicit in ide our idea of counting that selects out one or the other of those as the sort of unique, reasonable extension of counting to these kinds of cases, okay? So, um, um, so the first problem is, um, um, you know, the business of selecting the measure is it, it, th there isn't a unique extension of counting. If that's what you're thinking of yourself as doing, you're deluding yourself, okay, once you get to something like statistical mechanics. There's a long history of attempts by people like James um, to fix this up, to appeal to other features of the system which would select out one measure or the other. Um, um, these all fail, okay? Good. Second problem, which I think is sort of more important, um, but less widely discussed, even in the finite case, so everybody ought to be pulling back and saying, wait a minute, something crazy just happened, okay? Um, I said I know nothing about this system except that it's in one of these states, okay? Um, and the next thing you know, I've got myself a precise probability that it's in some particular one of them, okay? And, I, you know, you got to say, I must have dozed off somewhere there and, and missed something because something nuts just happened, okay? Um, I said I knew nothing, and all of a sudden I happen to know that the probability that it's in this state is 1 over n, okay? And now I'm going to go on and use that to explain the behaviors of smoke and ice cubes and so on and so forth, and this is just insane, okay? Can I make a, a, a question? Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly right. The states are identical. And, here, and, and that produces the following argument, which I think has a simple logical flaw in it. The argument is, look, to adopt any other probability distribution, um, and this refers to exactly what you said, to adopt any other probability distribution would violate the symmetry inherent in my epistemic situation, okay? I have no way, that is what I've said about my epistemic situation, is that I have no way of distinguishing between these possibilities. Tim. Right. They were really worried about gambling. Right. And in the case of gambling, like the site, you know, or you're supposed to know, or it's supposed to be the case, that there are certain actual symmetries in the physical system. Yeah, like this is the genes. This is the genes sort of argument. Right. Yes. And if you know that these symmetries exist, <clears throat> No, but I, I guess I disagree. Right. Right. No, so I... Right. Right. So I guess, I guess I disagree with that. But, but we're going to get into that. Yeah. Well, I, I guess, um, you know, that's why I just saw that. I mean, I think you're right. There's a big difference between knowing an awful lot about a system, so, so much that you put so much that you think as you know, the probability of this can exist, that of the value could be the same as that. And that's knowing an awful lot. That's injecting the symmetry, injecting the vector probability. There's a big difference between that and saying, I know of no reason why this, this could be more likely than others. Good. So this is going to get us into 
issues that I think will be contentious, but that I'm, I'm anxious to have these disagreements brought out. Um, um, let's stick first with the first argument. Right, so the obvious thing to say to this guy is, um, no, uh, you know, the, the thing to say to this guy is, which part of I have no clue do you not understand, okay? I have no clue means I have no clue. Is there any other way I could act besides assigning equal probabilities um, which respects the symmetry inherent in my epistemic situation? Of course there is. I could say I have no clue means I have no clue. I am going to abstain from assigning probabilities um, to these various different things because my situation is that I have no clue, okay? And, and so it's just wrong, okay, to think that um, the only reasonable thing for me to do is to assign probabilities of 1 over n. Indeed, that's a wildly unreasonable thing for me to do, and it should have given everybody pause that they're getting something for free. You know, it should have made people giggle in a very guilty way <laughs> that they're getting something for free that they know they didn't earn. Okay, yes? Yes. Um, so it looks like we want to, at the end of the day, find some explanation. Yes, we do. We do. And luckily, we have one. Um, uh, but, uh, but we'll get to that. We'll get to that in a minute. Yeah. God, the time, I guess all the speakers have experienced the fact that the time goes very fast. But yes. If somebody puts a gun to my head, I don't understand. No, I don't understand this. If somebody puts a gun to my head and tells me to choose one, it seems to me that the right thing for me to do is to say, "You're being really, really unfair," <laughs> because I have no clue. Okay, what do you want from me? <laughs> um, Okay, let's move on to uh, a second um, and much less obviously unreasonable view, which I think is the one that, uh, that uh, um, people were alluding to um, a few minutes ago, that Tim and Wayne were alluding to a few minutes ago. Um, and this is one that I'd like to understand better than I do. Um, um, this is the one that Tim used implicitly, maybe explicitly, for example, in discussing Boltzmann's derivation um, of uh, the collision cross-sections, of these cylinders that you get out of the collision cross-sections, and Boltzmann assumes that, uh, uh, that the number of particles in any of those cylinders described by the cross-section is th that the relative numbers of particles in different ones of those cylinders are proportional to their volume, okay? Um, and the argument was something like, well, that's what we would expect. Um, uh, and given that that's what we would expect, noting that those volumes have a certain proportion to one another, or noting that those volumes are equal to one another, is where an explanation, say, of the increase of, of entropy, of the, of the approach of the velocity distribution to the, Maxwell, to the Maxwell distribution, to the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution, um, that's the appropriate place, since that's what we would naturally expect, for an explanation to come to an end. Yeah. Yes. You use the technical term, which is something like, okay, actually what I said was nothing like what you said. <laughs> Let's see, they were sounds. <laughs> they were. <laughs> what, I, what I said was, if certain things are statistically independent, if we don't think that in absence of some specific antecedent reason, 
Right. You don't think that fact requires a further explanation. Right. That tells you nothing about what they said. Zero. It just says if you open your eyes and you happen to know that the two systems are not statistically correlated. Oh, okay. Then Good. You say, There's nothing here for me to Okay, so it's the so it doesn't seem unrelated, but it seems like the point you're making is that it's the converse in some way. That is, um, it's not it's not no, 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 no. Okay, okay. Wait, wait. Yeah, Let okay. we'll we'll get into that. Um, good. So it sounds like um, it sounds like what what you're saying was um, um, if that's what we find. So not that that's what we expect. Right. If that's what we find. We, are uns we find ourselves unsurprised and not in need of further explanation. Yeah. Right, good. Um, good. This seems to me, on both versions, but of course I'll accept yours, um, an odd way to talk about explanation. Um, um, the idea that once we find ourselves unsurprised by something, we don't we, we don't stand in need of further explanation. Seems a really weird picture of, say, the history of science. Hold on one second. Tim. I mean, I don't know what. You know, Newton sees an apple fall from a tree, okay? Least surprising imaginable thing. Um, nobody in the history of the world was surprised by a vision like that. Of course it stands in need of explanation. More generally, I take it the project of fundamental physics, okay, is to produce an explanation either in the, you know, is to produce an explanation of every physical phenomenon. The explanation may be trivial, that the phenomenon in itself constitutes a fundamental law, okay, or if not, it's a phenomenon that we want to see derived from fundamental laws or from fundamental laws together with initial conditions or something like that. And I don't understand talk about why it's appropriate for explanations to stop anywhere before that. Okay. Yes, Tim. Again, this is all one take, okay? <laughs> Let's see, Tim. Wait, wait, Tim. Yeah. You introduce the surprise just to make fun of the position. No, no. No, Tim. I'm putting a coin. Yeah. And some guys put the coin in Australia. Yeah. And we do a very careful analysis and see no statistical correlation between them. I think the appropriate thing to do is to say, okay. Good. Yes, the and question is, I don't think so. Easy. Yeah, okay. That's a view I disagree with. By the way, we, we don't, well, Tim, what, hold, hold on one second. I mean, I don't, this is a silly thing to get into an argument about, and, and I won't do it. But I, I do think I remember you're saying the words, uh, if, if there are equal numbers in equal volumes, that's what we would have expected. Okay. Um, um, okay. Yes. Anyway, good. Let's let's get all psychological reactions out of it. I disagree with that statement. I don't think there's a subtle case by case question of where explanations should properly come to an end. I think there's a general claim, a, a generally valid claim about where explanations, physical explanations, should come to an end. They should come to an end at the fundamental laws and initial conditions and not elsewhere. This may be a disagreement between us. Um, um, but, but yes, there is a disagreement there. Yes? Um, so in your case, wouldn't, wouldn't it be that you want to explain to me why the measures of some of these conditions are so different? Why they're all leading to the same measurement? That would be your point. But I'm, I'm not saying whether that's a good question. Yeah. 
Um, good. That, um, I don't know how to characterize this view. Um, I don't want to do something that Tim is going to say is making fun of it. Um, so I had characterized it. So the principle of indifference is an a priori, is a view that we have a priori access to, uh, to these probabilities. Um, this view is, I don't know what, it, the, the pluralism about where explanations end view um, um, or something like that. I was going to call it the quasi a priori view, but I know that's going to make Tim angry. So uh, uh, I don't know what to call it. Um, yeah, some kind of pluralism, some kind of, in order to know when the explanation is at an end, you've got to have good taste. Um, um, there's no completely general rule about that or something like that. Good. Third attitude towards this measure. Um, we believe it for completely empirical reasons, um, just as we believe uh, in various fundamental laws of physics, among which I think, on this view, this ought to be counted as one. Um, the reason we adopt this measure has to do with its empirical success. Um, it's the same reason that we adopt dynamical laws of various kinds, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, it seems to me that the sensible attitude towards these measures is this third one. Uh, uh, for, the reasons, for, for the reasons I've just, you know, we've just been discussing. Um, um, I want, if this measure is something I need in order to get certain results or in order to know which solutions to neglect, that needs to be among the fundamental laws because it's with those that it seems to me, and only with those, that it's appropriate for physical explanations to come to an end, those in initial conditions. So, um, good. Let's get back on, yeah, Mary. Right. That's a really good question. Um, um, that's a really good question. And yes, I, I, well, so let's put it this way. Um, and this is going to maybe depend some, although I don't think too much on what kind of metaphysical attitude one takes towards laws of nature and stuff like that. But yeah, I think the hope is um, that, the laws are gonna, that the laws that are sufficient to do this are going to turn out to be fairly simple, okay, and fairly small in number, okay. To the extent that they don't turn out that way, um, the hopes of the scientific enterprise are to that extent frustrated. And, uh, and if they turn out radically not to, you know, you just can't find anything simple and exceptionless to say about how the world works, then the world has turned out to be unaccommodating to the scientific enterprise. So, um, so yes, um, I do think you have to hope that, uh, that there's going to turn out to be something simple to say. Um, um, and to the extent that there isn't, that's a, that's a threat to the, to the scientific project. And that undercuts a bit your claim of those purely empirical things. What, why do you say that? Oh, you mean, you, let's see, I'm, I'm not sure I understand that. That is, the hope is that we're going to find something simple and empirically if adequate. If you don't find it simple, you're saying it sort of threatens the whole scientific method. Sure, that's right. That's 
No, 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 but I understand. If somebody says, what are our reasons for believing F equals MA, or what are our reasons for believing the Schrodinger equation, the, the first thing to say, I mean, this isn't the last thing to say, but the first thing to say is, oh, uh, you know, as with all scientific claims, we, we believe them because of their empirical success. Now, from there, the conversation could, of course, go on, but look, there are lots of other things one could write down which are in agreement with the empirical facts. And then you start saying, yes, there are certain other features we like to find in our scientific theories. When we have a choice among various hypotheses, we prefer the simplest one. Um, um, we prefer the smallest number. So of course, there's a whole discourse in philosophy of science on theory choice. That doesn't undercut the claim that science is an important sense, an empirical epistemic project. But I was not objecting to that claim. I was objecting to the, the way you presented the third alternative as it had the um, face of being, I would have thought you would say, merely empirical. No. Not just an empirical no. component is one thing, but that simplicity. No, 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 of course. Of course. What I meant was it's scientific in the more familiar sense. Um, our reasons for believing it are like our reasons for believing F equals MA or the Schrodinger equation or something like that, okay? And not reasons like, oh, uh, I think explanations can end here um, or something like that. Um, there are lots of hands up. Um, Kevin. Right. Good. Right. The authority derives from some a priori principle of rationality. And the third one is that it derives from empirical fact. Well, but I, I, I accept Shelley's qualification here. It derives from the same sorts of sources that the authority of F equals MA or the Schrodinger equation derives from. That's something in which empirical success plays an enormous role. Um, is a necessary requirement, but uh, Shelley rightly points out that empirical success by itself won't typically select out a unique, um, a, a unique theory. Um, so in a, in a way that's very familiar from philosophy of science, other considerations of simplicity, elegance, explanatory power, um, blah, 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 yeah. enter the picture. Okay. Good. Um, the second, look, the second option is one that puzzles me. The second option, um, um, the second option seems to say there are certain junctures before you get to the fundamental laws, okay, where it may be appropriate to say the task of, ex of explanation is now successfully concluded, okay? Somebody says, why do you say that? Okay, um, and the person says, well, there are, there are no correl... I, I mean, I, this is more for Tim to say. I mean, so maybe that's a good way, that, that's a good blank to fill in. Wait, in the, in, the, in the first and third cases, it's clear. I, this, the second case is one that I confess puzzles me. Um, so, so maybe Tim is, uh, is, uh, is somebody who could help us here. What's happening in the second case, so I didn't, I, I didn't give an answer and I didn't mean to be giving an answer in the second case. I'll set it up and then there's a blank to fill in, okay? In the second case, somebody says, I have it on a certain kind of authority. What kind of authority is an extremely good question. I have it on a certain kind of authority that the explanation has now been successfully concluded. Okay? And somebody says, where did you get that? On what kind of authority is it that you have that? And now maybe Tim can speak.
Oh, yeah. No, 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 of course you can. Yeah. Yeah. Right. 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 The initial conditions have to be very, 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 very hyper fine tuned. Probably a couple of more varies. Yeah. Do you consider then that you have to describe the initial conditions, which is going to be a very, 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 very non simple thing to do? Right. To complete the physical explanation. No. Well, I'm, it sounds ominous, but I'm not sure. I'm not sure I know what you mean. Um, um, so here's the deal. Um, um, there are certain things we want to explain about um, Croatia. Um, um, so let me see how to put this. Um, In a deterministic dynamics, like Newtonian mechanics, um, um, the, uh, the fundamental laws plus the exact initial conditions with all the varies logically entails everything. Okay? Um, um, good. Um, those aren't the kinds of explanations that humans can hope to uh, explicitly construct because of the calculational difficulties, blah, blah, blah. Um, if we could, we'd, would we be in a different situation? Of course. What's that? No, I, I mean, of course we'd be in a different situation, but maybe I don't know what difference you're referring to. I don't see why we have to do that. You know there's some initial condition. Right. can't say what it was. Right. Say it again. Right. What we, do want, what we do want about things like the World Cup, okay, is to know that we can more or less, for betting purposes, neglect the possibility, for example, that the winner of the World Cup was an elementary school soccer team, okay, or something like that. Um, the theory had better give us that, because that's something we all take ourselves to be pretty sure of, okay. But so what, wait, repeat the, repeat the question. Right, right. The kind of thing that Hempel called a probabilistic explanation, okay? We c no, not relative to the initial, con relative to the laws, plus, uh, plus some other things we know about the history of the world, but which amount to much less than a complete knowledge of the history of the world. We can lay out in detail what the probabilities were, or we can lay out, depending on how much we know, to a certain degree of detail. I'll give, I'll give actually in a minute um, a, a sort of general description of, of what I think this imperialistic picture takes to count as an explanation. So, so maybe we can get back to that in a minute. I wonder if I, I'll, I wonder if I'll get there, but anyway. We've been an hour here, and I still don't know what the speaker actually wants to say, because he's been constantly interrupted. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I don't know what. I object to that less than, than other people seem to, because it does seem like it, it's true that I haven't gotten to the main part of what I wanted to say, but I think it's also true that we're talking about issues that are fundamental and important 
to the general topic we want to be describing here. So I thank you for your sympathy, um, um, but I don't want to discourage people from, uh, I, I don't want to discourage people from interrupting. Um, but I, I do appreciate it, and maybe in deference to your comment, let me plow on um, a little bit further, because I'm <laughs> flabbergasted to find that I'm about a tenth of the way through what I wanted to say, and I have 15 <laughs> minutes left. Um, um, but, so let me, let me say, okay, put all that aside. We've got these measures, there's a debate about what the status and the authority of these measures is, and so on and so forth. We've got them, okay? Um, with those measures in hand, whatever exactly they're about, and whatever exactly they mean, um, we've got an argument from Boltzmann and his various inheritors, um, um, a plausibility argument that this measure makes it likely that the thermodynamic transitions that we actually see in the world makes it overwhelmingly likely that, uh, uh, that the thermodynamic transitions that we actually see in the world are the ones that the theory predicts actually obtain. Okay, um, that's an enormous triumph, one of the great triumphs of theoretical physics. But um, there's a famous trouble um, with this account, which has been alluded to um, ob obliquely a couple of times before um, in our sessions here. Um, the trouble is, this is the so-called reversibility objection um, to the H theorem, the trouble is that all of these arguments work exactly as well in reverse, okay? Um, that if we predict um, the future of an unmelted ice cube um, sitting in this room now as, you know, 20 minutes later there's going to be a puddle on the table, um, and if we make that prediction by taking the present macro state, taking the standard uniform probability distribution over the microstates compatible with that macrostate, plugging that into the equations of motion and evolving it forward, we get that. It's going to follow from the time reversal symmetry of the fundamental equations of motion that we would get the same retrodiction toward the past, okay? Um, um, the, this is another um, um, dramatic good news, bad news kind of situation. Um, um, the, the predictions toward the future are exactly the ones we want and observe. The retrodictions toward the past are wildly false um, when put beside our actual experience of the world. And to skip over a lot, there's a canonical method of patching this trouble up. Um, this is a method, once again, I'll defer to the people who know the history better, this is a method which I take it Boltzmann had something like this in mind. Certainly people like Feynman um, later on um, had something like this very explicitly uh, in mind. Um, it's, it's something that lots of people um, have mentioned. The, the canonical way of patching this trouble up is to supplement the dynamical equations of motion and this measure, which I'll call the statistical postulate, with a new, um, uh, with, with, a, with a boundary condition, um, which is which, uh, on the evolution of the world, which is, which is often referred to now as the past hypothesis, um, um, to the effect that the universe, and I don't want to say in the past, because because on this view, this is where you get your notions of past and future from, but in one temporal direction, um, um, uh, about uh, you know, several billion years from, from now, um, the universe had um, a, a particular simple, compact, symmetric, cosmologically sensible boundary condition, a kind of Big Bang boundary condition. Um, or pre-inflationary boundary condition, um, or something like that. So the patched up picture consists of the complete deterministic microdynamical laws, um, 
and the statistical postulate, whatever exact philosophical form that takes, um, and this past hypothesis. And with that amended picture in place, the arguments of Boltzmann are going to make it plausible, of Boltzmann and his inheritors are going to make it plausible that this piece of paper is going to be yellower in the future, and ice cubes are going to be more melted, and people are going to be more wrinkly, and smoke is going to be more dispersed, and so on and so forth, and that they have all been less so, just as our experience tells us in the past. With that additional stipulation in place, to put it another way, the Boltzmannian arguments are going to make it plausible that the second law of thermodynamics remains in force all the way from the end of the world back to its beginning. Okay. Um, so, um, um, what we have from Boltzmann then is a probability distribution uh, over the possible initial conditions of the universe, which when we combine it with the exact deterministic microscopic equations of motion, apparently makes good empirical predictions about the values of the thermodynamic parameters uh, of macroscopic systems. Um, and there's a question about what you want to make of that. David, yes. Feynman had it for sure. No, he didn't talk about a probability distribution. Oh, no, no, no. He, he talked about adding it as a law Absolutely. that the, yes. So you're, so you're, you're oh, oh, no, no, I agree. I agree. I, I'm sorry. I just meant to refer to the past hypothesis part. Yes. Um, um, good. Um, and there's a question about what to make of this success. You might take the success merely as evidence of the utility um, of this probability distribution as an instrument for the particular purpose of predicting the values of thermodynamic quantities. But the natural thing to do, unless and until we, it somehow gets us into trouble, is to imagine maybe that um, the, this probability distribution is in some sense literally true of the world. Okay. And if you suppose something like that, um, um, then the stakes get much, much larger very, very quickly, okay? Um, if you suppose something, because if you've got a deterministic theory and you've got a probability distribution over initial conditions of the universe, those two together are agnostic about no question about the physical history of the world whatsoever, okay? Those two together are going to assign a determinate probability value to every constructible proposition about the physical history of the world, okay? The probability that we're sitting here now, the probability that Trump gets reelected, um, um, the probability that Croatia is, is the runner-up in, uh, 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 in the World Cup, blah, 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 okay? Um, 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 so, um, it's a good thing. <laughs> um, um, but one can immediately see the sort of uh, uh, alarming imperialism um, of this kind of view. If we take this probability distribution that we get from trying to reduce thermodynamics to statistical mechanics realistically, okay, then there's some sense, and exactly what sense that is requires a lot of discussion, but there's some sense in which what we've got is much, much broader than what we started out aiming at, okay? If we're going to take this probability distribution realistically, what we've got is the complete science of the world, okay? Um, something in which, um, something which, as I said, assigns determinate probabilities to every, uh, 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 to every formulable proposition about the physical history of the world, and must either be false or 
in some implicit sense, contain all the truths of all of the special sciences, okay, of economics, of psychology, uh, blah, 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 blah. Um, good. Needless to say, the same thing, you know, this doesn't depend on um, uh, the Newtonian equations of motion, and it doesn't even depend on the determinism um, of the fundamental equations of motion. Precisely the same thing is manifestly going to apply to any probability distribution over the possible exact microscopic initial conditions of the world, together with any complete set of laws of the time evolutions um, of those micro conditions. Um, what we've got here, to put it in a slightly different way, is an assignment of a determinate probability, at least in the deterministic case, to every one of the trajectories compatible with the fund, every one of the trajectories, you know, out to t equals infinity, um, that, that's compatible with the equations of motion. Um, what's that? Uh, that's correct. I'm sorry. You're right. In both cases, you'll have an assignment of probabilities to every trajectory. Um, right. Sorry. Um, 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 any little bundle of trajectories or any little bundle of initial conditions. Um, um, and, and any little proposition about, uh, you know, a, the physical hist you know, a certain incident in the physical history of the world falling between these, uh, these boundaries. Yes. Thank you for the correction. Yes. There are. Um, and that's, a, that's something that I hesitated a moment and decided not to mention earlier on. But what I was going to say um, uh, at the end of this uh, uh, little introduction about the necessity of probabilities entering somewhere um, is that um, in, in quantum mechanics, um, there is an interesting possibility. So in most of the, um, uh, in, in say, Bohmian mechanics. Um, probabilities or, or these kinds of measures um, enter into the fundamental physics of the world twice, okay? Um, uh, the first time is um, a measure that, uh, that uh, a typicality measure over uh, positions of particles given the wave function of the world. Um, that's the one that gives you the correct probabilities for, say, outcomes of typically quantum mechanical measurements of spin or something like that. And the second one is the one we've been talking about here, which is a measure over initial wave functions, which would give you the statistical mechanical probabilities. There are other proposals for solving the measurement problem, like the GRW theory, which, unlike Bohm, have stochastic, have fundamentally stochastic dynamical laws. And there's reason to believe that in a theory like GRW, um, the stochasticity and the dynamical laws can do both of those jobs for you, okay? Um, that is, there's reason to believe that it's going to be a consequence of GRW, for example, that if you consider all the micro conditions compatible with the macro description, there is an unmelted ice cube sitting on the table. It will not be true merely of most of those micro conditions and not merely of a set of measure one of those micro conditions, but it'll be true of every single one of those micro conditions separately, okay? that the probability of, the, of there being a puddle on the table 10 minutes from now is high, okay, um, is comparable to what we think it is in, in thermodynamics. So yeah, this all depends, of course, it's, it's an empirical question about whether we're going to, wh whether GRW or something like it is going to turn out to be the right way to solve the measurement problem. But if it were, um, it would accomplish something that's a pretty big deal. It would reduce the, uh, it would reduce the entry of these kinds of measures into the fundamental picture of the fundamental physical picture of the world from two to one. Um, right. Uh, still need the wave yes, we'll still need we'll still need something like the past hypothesis. What we wouldn't need 
is, uh, is anything like a measure, um, um, other than the one that's in the dynamics of the GRW theory. Any measure over initial conditions. Yeah, Nina. Right, right. Now, what do you do with these numbers? If you can take that, what, how do you test them? What is the empirical evidence of these numbers between zero and one? Oh, well, this is, so this is, this is like the question you asked the other day about the connection between, you know, single case prob. So, um, um, so, you know, here's what we do with them. I mean, if we knew them, um, I mean, the deal is that our empirical reasons for believing that those are the probabilities have to do with experiments that we've done of a very different kind on, on events of a type which are often repeated and so on and so forth. But we may take ourselves to have good reasons from that kind of empirical experience, okay, to put a probability distribution over the initial conditions of the world. And then once we have, this is a question analogous to the question, gee, if, if there are, you know, if, in, if, if inflation is true and there are many, many universes, th this is silly, this is not a scientific hypothesis, what do we do with that? And it seems to me the right answer is, no, it's a perfectly scientific hypothesis. It may not be one that we're able to test directly, okay, but we may have other reasons for believing that the Hamiltonian of the world is of the kind that gives rise to eternal inflation, okay? And in the event that we do, it would be right to say that we have good, though indirect, empirical reasons for believing in these many other universes that we can't observe. This happens all the time in science. So I think this is a case of something like that. What am I gonna do, how am I gonna test this prediction that here's the probability, hold on one second, Bear, that Croatia wins the World Cup I'm not going to directly test that, but if you ask if I have empirical reasons for believing that, yes, I do. Because I have empirical reasons for believing in a probability distribution over initial conditions that entails that. Yeah, Barry. Also, the only thing that is that's me on the Oh, okay. So tell me. So tell me. On, on, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know how much time you spend with it <laughs> to explain that what, you are, what are acceptable and empirical distributions. You mean in the paper? Yeah. yeah. I, I thought you, you were somehow liking that or understanding. But I'm not sure how I'm saying. So m maybe it will help. I agree. But and what? Oh, no, that's not right. Um, so here is, and this is something that Barry's going to go into a lot. Um, and this does depend on um, what attitude one takes toward the metaphysics of laws and something like that. No, um, um, this probability distribution is not a reference, is, is a way of describing our single world, okay? Um, it's a way of describing it like this. I mean, I don't wanna, I have one minute left. Um, what do I wanna say about this? Can I have five minutes, Tim? Okay. <laughs> okay. Right, okay, good, 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 good. So I guess there are just two things that it's now, well, there was one th more thing that I thought I had to say, but now you've made it urgent for me to say something else. Um, um, here's the deal. The way I'm understanding what it is to be a law of nature, okay, is to be some, um, some compact and simple and highly informative claim about what kind of world we actually live in, the actual trajectory of the world, okay? Um, the way I usually introduce this in classes is you tell a little story um, about, 
you know, you, you manage to make an appointment with God. These are very hard to get. And, uh, and the day comes and you get all dressed up and, and you go to your appointment with God. And God says, what would you like to know? And, and you say, tell me what the world is like. And God starts to say, well, this particle was there at such and such a time, and that particle was there at such and such a time, and dot, 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 dot. And, uh, uh, and you say, um, uh, yeah, I'm actually supposed to have lunch with somebody later, and uh, if we could speed this up somehow, uh, I'd appreciate it. I don't really have time um, for all this. And, and of course, more literally, humans don't have the mental capacity for all that and so on and so forth. And God says, what do you want from me? You asked me to tell you about the world, I'm telling you about the world. I say, you say, I take it back. Here's what I'd like. Um, tell me the most you can about what the world is like, subject to the constraint that I could fit it on a t-shirt, okay? Um, tell me the most you can, subject to that constraint. God says, okay, um, I'll tell you the most I can, subject to that constraint. Um, um, and he says, F equals MA, okay? And you rightly observe, like we started out with, you're telling me almost nothing, okay? You're telling me nothing about whether the Earth is gonna take a right turn all of a sudden and so on and so forth. Can't we do a little better? There's still a little room on the T-shirt um, after I've said F equals MA. God says, okay, um, here's the deal. Uh, he says, I could tell you the initial conditions. You say, okay, tell me the initial conditions. He starts telling me the initial conditions. We get into the same problem. I have a luncheon appointment. Um, what makes you think the only thing I had to do today was talk for you? Uh, blah, blah, blah. Um, um, and God says, okay, what can I do here? Ah, I'll tell you what I'll do. Uh, I won't tell you the exact initial condition. We don't have enough time. I'll tell you that the condition was one of those which is typical, a word you guys ought to like, with respect to a probability distribution like this, okay? That'll tell you a lot about what to expect, okay? Of coin flips, ho hold on just one second, of coin flips, blah, 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 okay? This isn't any kind of puzzling reference to what's going on in, uh, in worlds other than the actual one. It's God's attempt to tell you something useful about which particular world you are in, in a way that's gonna fit on a t-shirt. Sorry, Nino, I didn't mean to cut you off. Yeah, good. Some of the suggestions that you say is that the morning, the initial point, is the interruption with the function on the set of all possible points in the evolution of position. So God is using a lot of time, spending a lot of time informing you about the probability. No, I don't know what you mean by it's simple. To specify the location of this point or to specify it, it in a way that's going to give us information, I claim would be a very, very complicated thing to do. Very complicated thing to do. Um, but you want to give the function, a very detailed function on the initial condition. Detailed but very simple, smoothly varying. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah, okay, okay, or, uh, okay, good. There's a lot more things to discuss here. Let me just take the remainder of my five minutes to respond to a question that Tim raised earlier that I promised to clarify. You can see how much I'm skipping over here. Uh, uh, hold on a second. Just imagine how much fun we could have had. Okay. Uh, no. No, Shelley, please. <laughs> but I, I, I made, you know, I made final amendments to it last night after midnight, and after of having had a lot to eat and drink with you. Okay, okay, good, good, sure, sure. Um, um, if anything along the lines, this is a picture that Barry and I, this this probability distribution over trajectories. Um, is something which, if it were true, would have to in some sense amount to the entirety of natural science, um, is something that Barry and I have taken to calling the mentaculus. Um, there's a funny story about that, which it probably... Be, it's an easy story. 
Uh, okay, I will leave the story I said, which probably Barry will tell you. Um, um, it's unflattering to both of us, but anyway. Uh, um, um, good. If a picture like this is the right picture, then here's what it, th then here's what explanation consists in. Here's what explanation is about, okay? You want to explain a particular phenomenon? Here's what you do. You start with this mentaculus. You start with this probability distribution over complete trajectories of the world. You conditionalize that distribution on whatever particular features of the world play a role in the scientific explanation in question. That is, you condict conditionalize the mentaculus, you conditionalize this probability distribution on whatever particular features of the world appear either explicitly or implicitly among the explanons of the special scientific explanation in question. And then you check to see whether or not the resultant probability distribution, the conditionalized probability distribution, makes the explanandum likely. If it does, then we've recovered the special scientific explanation from the fundamental physical theory. And if it doesn't, then either the fundamental theory or the special scientific explanation or both are wrong. Um, no doubt there would have been lots of discussion about this if it had come earlier. That's, that's the basic picture of explanation that we have in mind in this imperialistic reading of statistical mechanics. And I'll leave it there. I'm sorry, I'm sorry I ran late. Um, yeah, but I asked you to interrupt me. <laughs> uh, I, I, I defer to the chair, yeah. Correct. Or, or equivalently, um, as Shelley rightly points out, either on a deterministic theory or an indeterministic theory, that will amount to a probability distribution over complete trajectories. But anyway, maybe that's it. Yeah. I'm sorry to interrupt you. Oh. Oh, in practice? Forget about it. <laughs> <laughs> This is, a, this is a comment about the structure of logical implicature in a picture like this. Nobody is, is, I mean, Tim once told me, and this is a historical remark, that the old proponents of the unity of, of, unity of science actually thought of themselves as giving methodological advice, not just advice about logical relationships. That seems crazy. Okay, um, um, you know, if you want to, uh, if you want to do effective psychotherapy or something like that, it would be inadvisable to start with the Schrodinger equation and the, and the initial probability distribution. Um, we know all sorts of rules of thumb, okay, which if everything works out had better in principle, in a logical sense, follow from all this if these things are true, but we know much, you know, by more direct empirical experience, all kinds of rules of thumb about the special sciences and about how to do that. So no, this is certainly not, um, in general, supposed to have implications about the best practical methodology um, for doing the special sciences. It's supposed to be a way of understanding how the world could be such that all these fit together, okay? Yes. 
Uh, no, it's a little broader. You, you know, you can inch outward a little bit. You're not going to get up to psychology, okay? But you can inch outward a little bit at least from the standard thermodynamical predictions in ways that have already been mentioned. You notice things like Brownian motion, okay? You say, I wonder if, uh, if the measure we're using gives the, gives the right answers about Brownian motion. Insofar as we can tell, it does, okay? Or you wonder about departures from thermodynamics, statistical fluctuations, okay? Um, um, is the measure we're using giving us right answers about that? Looks like it does. Or you wonder about cases where you've got a pencil balanced on its tip, and you're wondering which way it's going to fall, okay? Um, and you're wondering about various ways of breaking the deadlock or what it means in general for something to happen just by chance or something like that. You can convince yourself that it's probably going to give you right answers about that, okay? So you can inch very, and by very small increments outward. So I wouldn't say it's quite fair to say it's just thermodynamics, but uh, it, it's hard to get, it's not psychology, okay? That's for sure. Yeah, fair. No, sorry. Yeah, let me ask you a hypothetical question. Suppose instead of thermodynamics, we were talking about an ideal of woman's here. Yeah. Woman's here. <laughs> okay. And suppose it turned out that none of us here has ever, you know, left in the memory, has ever liked a woman or any woman we ever liked is anything like the woman you are describing. Okay. Should we be distressed or should you? Gosh, I have no idea what this question means. Um, um, and given, given, um, given the discomfort of some women um, entering philosophy, maybe I'd rather be a question about ideal manhood. But, uh, but uh, there's, uh, uh, I, I wasn't milking applause. Um, but, but, um, um, but I'm, I, that seems like a, a, an, an evaluative question rather than a scientific no, question. I'm not really well no, I'm oh, okay. I'll the question. Okay. Uh, the criteria, if I lack my memory, I will not find a single explanation which I like that meets your criteria for an explanation. Oh, so say a little more. Um, okay. What, 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 that, give an explanation that you like and make and make it clear why it doesn't why why it doesn't meet these criteria. Okay. An explanation I like is a certain crystal sets in a certain way. Right. And if you do the textbook calculation, it turns out they should set in a completely different way. If okay. that's true, then I take it the textbook explanation is wrong. Precisely. Yeah. Now, Right. And he finds the missing electron mode per molecule. Right. Right. And because of this, the crystal actually sets the way it sets. Good. Words, he explains it. Right. So that's a good explanation. Right. But this is not a reduction to first principles. No, no, no. It's n no, no, no. Once again, um, um, and and I wasn't, and in part I'll plead shortage of time, um, but but um, look. Um, this is not supposed to be methodological advice about how to conduct the special sciences. And it is definitely not the best way to do psychotherapy or something like that to appeal to first principles, okay? Um, it's not methodological advice either in the sense of technology or in the sense of explanation in the special sciences. It's supposed to be a way of imagining if one is interested in such questions, how all these things might fit together, okay? What the logical relations between them might be, not about how it's practical to pursue these sciences, 
Okay? Those are supposed to be two completely different things. One may think, I'm interested in the special sciences, and I'm not interested in this larger question about how they all fit together, or how they all, in a logical sense, may be related to more fundamental sciences. That's fine. Nobody's, nobody's demanding that you be interested in that. If you are interested in that, this is a proposal about how to think about it. Well, I don't know what it means to say they have no contact. It's being asserted that they have logical contact with each other. It's not the case that, in many cases, that they have practical content with each other, contact with each other. Although, let me insert here, there are always surprises. A good example is something like the measurement problem in quantum mechanics. Okay? Somebody says, um, um, how is it that measurements have determinate outcomes? Okay. You might be inclined to say, oh my God, from first principles, that's going to be a really complicated question. A measuring device is something that consists of billions and billions of elementary particles. We have to solve the Schrodinger equation for this billion particle system, blah, 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 blah. But it turns out that among the first principles is this linearity of the dynamics, okay, which gives us a shortcut. For, to showing that there's such a problem directed that there's a feature of our everyday macroscopic experience which is in conflict, okay, with, um, um, with these fundamental principles. So there are all kinds of situations in which the fundamental principles have very simple and straightforward implications much farther up the line. But in general, they don't, okay? And, uh, and in general, a practitioner of a special science would probably be well advised to ignore fundamental physics. But people who are interested in the overall shape, in the, in the foundational structure of the world, may be interested in the logical relations among these different things that we want to say about the world. And this is addressed to questions like that. Bear, you'll be the last one. One is, I saw this question in some way where it could be thought of as highly relevant and really related to this. It came to mind in the last line, I think, of the book is the spouse part of that, where I think the last line is something like eternal womanhood, womanhood leap forever onward and upward. What you've done is sketch a view about what ideal science is aiming for so that it all Right. <laughs> but I tricked them. <laughs> right, right. Good, good, good. Thanks again. Thank you.